Bronze and iron have become iconic emblems of the classical period, after all, entire ages are named after these metals. But today we'll tell a different story, one of trade, human ingenuity and closely guarded secrets. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and when is the first historical reference to tin? The first mentions are from 1500 BC and it's in connection with an ancient Thalassocratic civilization originating in the Levant region of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Phoenicians. Phoenician colonies in what is modern southern Spain and the coasts of Portugal were a flourishing network of commerce, with one of its prime focal point being its industrious trade of locally mined silver and tin. As we explore the ancient records, other sources of tin are mentioned but are vague, clouded in mystery, such as for example the Tin Islands, Cassiteridis. These almost mythical islands were referenced as early as the 5th century BC, but people had little to no knowledge of where they were. But the Phoenicians knew how to reach them and kept their knowledge a secret. These islands were indeed at the farthest reach of the ancient world. They are what we now call the British Isles, namely the Isle of Scilly and Cornwall. Between the era of Phoenician Mediterranean dominance and the rise of Roman power, metallurgical understanding and experimentation was the domain of the Gallic Celts. It is them, we are told by Pliny the Elder, that invent the very concept of tinning. By tinning we mean the process of applying a thin coating of tin onto another core metal, effectively creating what we call tin plate. As the Romans step boldly into the historical frame and assert martial dominance, the locating, controlling and exploiting of tin mines became of paramount importance to central authorities. Roman provincial organisation and landscape analysis in connection with the reshaping of provincial economic structures and the Roman enforced occupation will now be discussed. The metamorphosis which occurred to the indigenous populations of these areas and their territories as a result of republican and imperial Roman annexation is significant. The scale and intensity of Roman mining operations in tin-rich deposit areas which were carried out in order to maximize productivity and the consequent exploitation framework had a tremendous effect to the socio-political and economic strata of subdued populations. By 19th BC, these included also the northwest of the Iberian Peninsula, becoming the province of Hispania Criterior, as formed by Emperor Octavianus Augustus. Furthermore, not only tin but silver and lead mines were constantly exploited beginning already in the Republican era. All of this reflected not only an insatiable hunger for precious metals but a high level of demand which was the result of a jaw-dropping metallurgical competence many may not be aware of. As more and more territories scramble under Roman expansion, we see the birth of an essential mechanism for resource production and population control. A mechanism that speaks to the pivotal role tin, among other metals, had in the ancient world. As a result, Roman territorial involvement left aggressive scars which are still visible after 2000 years, an everlasting evidence of Roman dominion. Roman metallurgical expertise is evident not only through the epigraphic textual and archaeological record but also because of several studies that have been carried out in order to evaluate the technological ability of Roman metallurgists of the time. A high skill level in metallurgical understanding is easily demonstrated by, for example, looking at silver plated coins, as sophisticated methods of manipulation and modification at a chemical level are encountered. An analysis of ancient Roman silver coin plating reveals data on microplating methods which included tailored surface chemical modification based on the mercury silvering process. Now these are the results of several tests such as the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, scanning electron microscopy, optical microscopy, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy among others. What this means is that the Romans were able to manipulate alloys at a chemical level and what's even more impressive is they could achieve this systematically at a microscopic scale producing adherent silver layers where the thickness was cohesive and uniform, all the way down to a few micrometers, a level of precision nothing short of impressive. On a similar note, tinning copper and bronze objects by putting them into electrical contact with metallic tin in a boiling aqueous solution of potassium hydrogen tartar was only one of the ancient techniques applied, as we will see. Tinning in ancient Rome was practiced for both cosmetic and functional purposes, including military applications, as we'll see later on this video. If you find this sort of topic fascinating, please consider subscribing and becoming a noble one. Why was tin so important to the Romans? Well, in my opinion, there are two reasons why tin was such a strategically decisive 
ore. One, tin was necessary for the production of tin bronze. After all, traditional bronze is an alloy made of copper and tin. An alternative to tin bronze was arsenical bronze, a highly poisonous metal, specifically an alloy that had more than 1% of arsenic by weight, at least archaeologically speaking. Which is a lot. A deadly poison which could be absorbed through your skin and eventually would kill the smith. Among many other symptoms, arsenic poisoning could cause damage to the nerves, especially the peripheral ones, causing muscle atrophy, even paralyzing some of the leg muscles, making it difficult to lift your foot. This could well be the reason why, in Greek mythology, Hephaestus, the blacksmith of the Olympians, has a limp, and so does Vulcan for the Romans, and many other deities within the Germanic tradition who also happen to be smiths, all the way up to the deep north. Yeah, that's not a coincidence. Regardless, this is why tin bronze was preferable over arsenical bronze, even though arsenical bronze made pretty damn good blades. Number two, tin was used for tinning, objects, shields and even armour for reasons and with methods we'll explore further on this video. Even when just focusing on binary alloy compositions, just copper and tin within Hellenistic and Roman bronze used for, say, furniture, statues, weapons and armour, the amount of variables of percentages of the constituents within any given cluster is significant. And if we were to look at lead-enriched bronze, Corinthian bronze and decorative polychromatic surface manipulation methods, the topic will become extremely deep. Thus, a thorough examination of ancient bronze will require its dedicated video if you're interested. Let me know in the comments below. And if I see enough comments, we'll make a video dedicated to the spectrum of data available for physiochemical analyses. I will tell you what classical bronze looked like. It's possible that not only the expansion into the Iberian Peninsula, but even Caesar's invasion of Britannia and eventually its conquest by Claudius were motivated by, among other things, the presence of tin deposits. Now, even though you need a lot more copper to make bronze than you need tin, copper was readily available, easy to find, quite common, and you had dedicated production centers in the Mediterranean, such as Cyprus. Cipro, Ice Ciprium, Cuprum, Copper. Tin deposits instead were a lot more rare. According to some historians, and I happen to agree, one of the possible reasons why there was a switching from bronze to iron, weapons and armour, in the classical period was because of the political and military upheaval caused by the collapse of the Bronze Age and the migration of the peoples of the seas. This made navigation in the Mediterranean difficult, reducing the flux of Phoenician trade ships connecting to the tin sources. Bronze becomes very expensive to make, so an alternative, iron, the metal that literally fell from the sky, is adopted instead. Not because of an innate superiority of iron weapons versus bronze weapons, bronze weapons were doing just fine, but because to make iron equipment all you needed were iron deposits and higher temperatures. It was harder to make but easier to find. But couldn't Romans just buy this tin instead of going ahead and conquering everything? We definitely know that the Romans imported whatever they didn't produce. For instance, in the imperial period, spices were imported from India and slaves from the Barbaricum the Romans imported from the Iberian Peninsula and it's also possible that they imported materials and particularly precious materials from Massilia and maybe even from Carthage. But as the Romans conquer modern day Spain and Britannia, now no one outside of the empire produces as much tin as the Romans do, which means all of the commerce and trade becomes now internal, exclusively internal. In Roman times, tinning was widely used, for example for horse fitting, military equipment, parade greaves, helmets and cuirasses are a good example, and cheaper ornaments imitating silver. Pliny uses the Latin term in linere for simple tinning done by wiping. He's also the one, as mentioned earlier, that reported that Celts invented a method that rendered copper and its alloys similar to silver. These objects were called incoctilia. The etymology of this Latin noun comes from the verb incoquere, a process that apparently involved strong heating of the object in a container. In other words, you can just translate it as to boil. If you look at the Roman armor replica that I own, namely the Lorica Segmentata Cobridge Type A, you will notice that, upon close inspection, the plates have been, indeed, tinned. Do we have any evidence to back up and substantiate this practice? Of course we do. Also note the dished out plates for my shoulders which make it an extremely accurate replica. Within the Roman world, the majority of physical examples are from the imperial era. And specifically for a lorica segmentata we have only one evidence, a shoulder plate from Xanten. The reason why we don't have a lot of examples in my opinion is because it would have been an expensive process and so not all soldiers could have afforded it. Probably something reserved for officers, maybe the lowest rank that could have afforded something like this would have been an optio. 
maybe. When you use thinning onto a bronze surface, then of course the effect is cosmetic. It changes the looks of it and makes it look silvery. But thinning on anything iron or steel based achieves another function, rust prevention. Which I personally love that I don't have to go there and oil my armor all the time. And that also justifies why sometimes we find it even on shields and lots of other elements of armor and war equipment. It just made it easier to maintain. Here is an example of a bronze helmet that was fully tinned and we still see the remains. Okay, but what was the value of tin then? Tin was more valuable than copper, but less valuable than silver. It wasn't necessarily a precious metal. Pliny also tells us that it's more valuable than lead, but then again, lead wasn't that valuable in the first place. So for an actual reference, how much bread could you buy if you owned an ingot of tin? Pliny tells us that a libra or a pound of lead cost seven denarii. By comparison, the same amount in tin would cost 70 denarii, so 10 times. One denario equals four sesterzi, ten assi. Now how much would bread cost in ancient Rome? Well, without considering inflation, we have one indication. Two assi could buy you two Roman pounds of bread, so 646 grams. Hence, the costs of one pound, 323 grams of tin, equaled 226 kilograms of bread. Whereas a pound, 323 grams of lead, would buy you 22.6 kilograms of bread. This is approximate, as we're not taking into consideration economic fluctuations. And the price of bread is based on the only example we have from a house in Reggio, which provides the only data of price of bread in comparison with weight. All right, noble ones, but as an introductory video on the concept of tinning in the classical period, I believe that this video up to this point will suffice. If you find this interesting, please let me know, and I will, of course, make more dedicated video to metallurgy, both in the classical world, why not, medieval Europe. As always, thank you so much for your support and for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to click in the description below to take advantage of the amazing offer by Atlas VPN. Thank you so much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. If you're enjoying this video so far, please take a moment to check out my Patreon page. With as little as a $5 support, you can help us ensure that we can continue to produce high quality and high researched content. And at the same time, you get access to polls, extra videos, unlisted streams, and much more. Thank you so much. Proudly presenting the Pendant of the Noble One. Look at this beauty. Original custom design created by me in collaboration with Viking Jewelry. And it's my way to celebrate all of you, because as you know, I've been calling you Noble Ones for the last 12 years. Well, this is indeed the pendant of you, the Noble Ones, who are the Custos Veritatis, written here in Latin, and it means Keeper of Truth, because that's the only thing that matters, the truth, whether it offends them or not. So, available in both silver and bronze. I think my favorite is the bronze one, but they're both great. And this can be bought as a set, as we offer the original ring of the Noble One, available in silver, bronze and gold, the bracelet of the Noble One, Silent Oath of Truth, and a more low-profile version of the ring for those who prefer something a little thinner, which we offer also in bronze, silver, 14 karat gold and 18 karat gold. Use the code Noble One for a 15% discount at checkout. And massive thanks to each and every single one of you. And thank you to my haters for supporting my work.